gentlemen. Welcome to the third. It's called Accelerate, Sustain and Accelerate Growth. We are going to discuss how startups and young businesses can accelerate their growth through access to finance and other support mechanisms. And I have the honor to introduce a stunning panel that uh, AfriLink has put together. And I would like to start, if all are already online, with, yes, with Melanie Keita. Melanie Keita, the CEO of Melanin Capital. As Melanin, sees, uh, Melanin Capital CEO, Melanie, you lead the development of the platform's investment products and the financial training curriculum. As a French Congolese private equity professional, working in an impact private equity fund in Frankfurt, you endeavor to leverage on your intercultural perspective and your financial expertise to contribute to economic development on the African continent. And you've worked in the impact investment field for the past four or five years in Africa and the Middle East, working with SMEs, with startups, with financial institutions. Having worked in different impact ventures like a, the Investors et Partenaires or also Finance in Motion, you bring a deep knowledge in corporate finance, fundraising, and also impact assessment to this panel. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Ian, for introducing me, for inviting me in this panel. Thanks a lot. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you. Second, I'd like to introduce Sohaila Ofata, director at BMW iVentures. Sohaila is a tech evangelista, a passionate, deep tech venture capital investor, believing the long-term opportunities for, social, for societal and ecological value creation through backing purpose-driven tech startups tackling the biggest problems in the transportation industry. With her contribution as director of platform, Sohaila embarks on a journey toward a world where sustainable and responsible venture, venture capital investing becomes a standard. BMW I Ventures invests in cutting edge solutions, focusing on BMW's current and future business in the technology and customer and service space. In addition to the investment activities, she works closely with BMW I Ventures portfolio companies. As the director of platform, she develops and implements strategic growth initiatives and provides operational support to these companies. And then Sohaila also has a vision to share with the panel, the African tech vision, but we'll dive deep into that later on. Third, it's a pleasure to introduce Tommy Davis, the Chief Investment Officer at Green Tech Capital Partners, and also the President of the African Business Angel Network. As a systems analyst turned tech strategy advisor, a public speaker and angel investor, Tommy Davis is a collaborator in chief at Technovision. He's the co-founder of the Lagos Angel Network and also President of the African Business Angel Network. He sits on a number of boards, amongst them the Board of Laptops for Learning in Nigeria, the World Business Angels Investment Forum, and the Global Business Angels Network. Early in his career, he led the implementation of innovative technology-led transformation initiatives in the oil and gas, the IT, and the telco sector for really influential global brands like El Fakiten, Marks & Spencers, Ernst & Young. But in 2000, he shifted his focus to Africa, where he helped to build the African Agriculture Technology Foundation or the One Laptop Per Child Initiative in Nigeria, just to name two. Besides that, uh, Tommy Davis has also published the book, The African Project Manager. Tommy, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. And last, but definitely not least, I am honored to introduce Andreas Beckermann, Senior Policy Advisor at the BMZ, the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Andreas Beckermann, you have 30 plus years of experience in development cooperation, including development finance. You're specialized on private sector development and economic policy. You head the working group of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development on economics, employment and trade, 
which is also responsible for the realization of the Marshall Plan with Africa. And you also work on German contributions to G20 investment summits, as well as the EU Africa Business Forum in this year. But you also have ample experience on the continent. Having served the BMZ abroad for 12 years, you spent, I believe, large parts of that on the African continent, mainly in Morocco and South Africa. So Andres Beckerman, welcome to this panel. Thank you, pleasure. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to discuss the funding landscape. And maybe Melanie, we can start with you. What does the funding landscape look like and how can it support startups on the African continent? And maybe you can mm. also add roles that you and your partners might play. Mm. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for, this, for this question, Ian. It's true that uh, the funding landscape in Africa has changed a lot, uh, let's say, for the past 20 years, and we have kind of the result of a long evolution, because at the beginning of the 2000s, it was completely uh, impossible for investors to, to go to Africa. It was a continent that was completely doomed, and only a few crazy fund managers were adventurous enough to invest in large companies, uh, large equity tickets uh, in, in companies that were one of the few. Uh, but after, I would say, uh, maybe 2008, after the crisis, we started to hear more about impact investing and how we could actually do more of investments but also of development uh, in emerging countries. And Africa uh, kind of was the big winner of, of uh, those big words around um, development finance and impact investing. So what we see today is also a lot of uh, private actors, but also of impact investors that were then joined by um, venture capitalists, I would say a little bit after when the tech movement became really big. Tech was becoming the new um, let's say, the, the new tool uh, to solve all African solutions. So we had more and more uh, fund managers getting large amounts of, of funding to invest in, in tech companies that can help Africa to kind of keep a level of development. And, and today, I think uh, it is clear that we have um, the public sector that was here before through development aid and joined by all those private actors, impact investors, and venture capitalists that are trying to, to, to support companies in Africa at all, um, all the different stages, from startups to large companies. However, what we could say, what we can see still on the funding landscape is that there's still a gap uh, to support small startups and, and small un un enterprises on the continent. And that is why AfroLink is actually putting together such a conference. Uh, yesterday, I was on the mentorship sessions with a lot of the startups, and they were telling me, telling me, I think there is no funding for Africa. We don't, we don't manage to get funding. But that is insane because, as as I just explained, like the funding landscape has been just been uh, developing and and increasing bigger and bigger for the past twenty. The reason why. Um, there are still startups and, and, and small companies that are still struggling to get access to that funding. Is, uh, in my opinion, is because all of the funds managers that came years after years, uh, thanks to also the support of, of, of the public sector, are fund managers that have seen an amount. They come with indeed a, a large amount of funding and with the idea of supporting change uh, in the African continent, but they have their own constraints. They have first the fund size constraint. When you have $100 million or $200 million to invest, you cannot invest small ticket sizes like 100,000 euros or 200,000 euros in, in small startups. However, this is what the startups need most of the time. They, they, they cannot absorb at that stage $1 million or $5 million. It is too much. So those funds are limited, first of all, because of their size. And second, because also of all the criteria that comes with their mandate. They have to achieve a certain amount of, of return and, um, and uh, in a certain period of time. And this impedes them to kind of take some additional risk. And this is why we've seen from 
the German government, for instance, different innovations that they've put in place to kind of help this ecosystem and this funding ecosystem to support better uh, the startups on the ground by having what we call blended finance approach, so mixing public funding with uh, private funding and support the startups with innovative instruments. We've seen more and more in the funding landscape uh, projects uh, like the ones with the Investor Partenaire based in Paris, in which they really try to support startups with recoverable grounds, of, uh, of, with instruments that are a little bit more flexible than the traditional um, equity instruments that we could have seen in the past years. And this makes a lot of sense to come uh, supporting the startups with those kind of instruments. Because if you look at a country like Germany, for instance, um, just to support uh, startups during COVID, I was amazed what kind of instruments and funds they managed to put in place to support early stage companies. They really have in mind that to start a business and to scale up, you need a uh, more flexible type of funding. You need to have a loan with lower interest rate, and this is what KFW, for example, uh, proposes, or you need recoverable grounds, meaning that it's a loan with no interest at all, but you just pay back the money if your business is successful. And this is what uh, we're seeing uh, more and more. And lastly, and I will end uh, my intervention on that, we're seeing more in the funding ecosystem what the work of the African Business Angel Network has done a lot for the past years, which is putting together structure, local structures that can support more adequately the entrepreneurs. Because if, on, if fund managers are only based in Europe with European costs and uh, with uh, the need of investing overseas, then you, you will always kind of find the same type of startups that are uh, available online that you can see at first sight and that you don't need to dig into when you're on, when you're on the ground. And I think uh, this is more and more important to build that ecosystem locally with local investors that can support and mentor small startups that require small amount of funding but a lot of mentorship and, and can grow with them with the help, of course, of other international investors. And at Man Capital, that's what we're trying to, to promote, basically, like promoting local ecosystems in partnership with um, European and international investors. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, since um, the angels were mentioned, Tommy, would you like to give us your perspective? How do you see the um, funding scene? And do you also observe similar gaps or similar mismatches of needs of startups and then commercially and publicly available means of funding? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think Melanie actually did an excellent job in laying out uh, what has been happening on the continent. Um, I'll sort of, I won't go as far back as she has. I'll just go back a decade and look at 10 years ago, um, the landscape we saw. Um, we were all very, very excited at the creation of startups. And um, I remember that uh, a few years further in 2012 when we were starting the lagos angel network we started to look around as to where else we could find local funders like ourselves um, by 2015 there were five angel networks we discovered on the continent um, and what then happened was the explosion of tech we started to see startups arising you know, out of nowhere, Silicon Valley came along. Uh, we had the visit uh, by the likes of Max Zuckerberg to Lagos, the famous Yaba visit. Jack Dorsey came down. A whole bunch of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley best came down and everything started to explode. But what we also found was a disparity between what was required and what was available. And that's what gave birth to the Africa Business Angel Network, which over the last five years has created 40 networks in 33 African countries, ensuring that startups not just, don't just get money, but they get mentoring, 
they get advice, they get guidance by people local who understand the terrain. Because Africa's startups primary challenge is actually policy. You know, the, 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 the local policies are crippling in a lot of instances. Uh, a typical example is what we saw happen in Nigeria with the right, with the bike hailing uh, investments that went in, in 2019, we were all very happy. There was Go Kata, there was, you know, the Chinese, everybody was coming in with lots of fundings because we discovered this new mode of transportation that would help the common people on the streets. Early this year, before COVID, what happens? The government turns around and decides that it's going to have inordinate licensing tariffs, and that essentially just killed that particular uh, startup. Fortunately, COVID kicked in and they, they pivoted into logistics and delivery, so some of them stayed alive. But that's the challenge with the African terrain, is this mismatch between the desire of useful exuberance in entrepreneurship and we have quite literally hundreds of thousands of startups now that are solving problems is you know that are real problems because before we had what i call the copycat syndrome and then as melanie will know we then had the grant premiers people who will just pitch for grants just to make a living but all of those are changing now as in 2013, uh, we so we talk about ABAN in 2015, but uh, the Africa Venture Capital and Private Equity Association was formed in 2013, and they are also a very, very active participant um, on the continent. Add that to the fact that as, as was being raised, the development partners are starting to look at the ideation stage and use grants to start to fund those. It's getting very, very exciting. Um, uh, uh, an example of what is happening is the work that Avan is doing with the uh, French Development Bank uh, on the Catalyst project, where if local investors invest in a startup that is in a hub that can be monitored, then they get matching funds into that startup as a grant. So quite literally doubling the investment made by the local participants. Why is that important? Well, it's the local angel that can watch and that can monitor, that can guide, that can protect the startup. And we have now well over 500 hubs, innovation hubs across the continent that are also changing the landscape of how companies are being built on the continent. So the ecosystem is alive and well, and it is thriving. Even this year with COVID, we have seen that inbound investment funds are actually matching what we had last year. Maxim Bayan of our, of our organization, Green Tech, actually monitored all, all investments above a million. And guess what? We've had over 70 of those this year already. But more importantly, we've seen in nearly a billion dollars still go into Africa in investment this year into startups. Smaller ticket sizes, but much many more transactions. And that is a very, very dynamic landscape when you consider that just as far back as what, let's, let's just take 2016, 2017, we went a couple of hundred million dollars coming onto the continent. So I'm quite optimistic. I'm very, very bullish with the attention people like AfroLink is giving to what is happening on the continent, that we will continue to see the increase in startup investment, but more importantly, these will contribute to the economic development of the continent. And to me, that is what is really, really important. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Andres Beckerman, this might be a good moment to bring you in, um, since both Melanie and Tommy m mentioned that they see a stronger presence of grants and blended finance and other state funded instruments um, in the market, enabling investments of private uh, sector investors on the continent. And would you like to blend in there, explain what you might be seeing? Because the German government does finance quite substantially private investments on this continent. And might you also want to explain why the German government is interested in that? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, um, 
Um, I think the the importance of the of the private sector um, is mentioned by by our minister when he says this is the amount of official development aid uh, f uh, for the whole, in the whole world. It doesn't change much over the years, and um, it's even a small a part of uh, what is needed in in investment in in development, and. Um, for uh, traditionally, we have the development finance institutions with a, a, a public sector and the private sector arm, and we have to be much more agile and um, bring in more uh, products when we see those challenges, which um, Melanie and Tommy, which you um, um, elaborated on. So. Um, um, I was present at last year's uh, conference and uh, we alluded to the G20 conferences we had in 2018 and 2019 when the uh, private sector investment was, was highlighted and um, Maria Flaxbart, our vice minister, said this morning that the, the big uh, lighthouse investments which are shown at these occasions in the presence of the heads of governments have to, have to be underpinned by a small uh, smart uh, investment. So this um, the ecosystem in the respective uh, country is like what, what we are looking at. And um, uh, we have uh, the, the Make IT and uh, when you look at their uh, website, uh, it says it takes a village to raise a child and it takes an ecosystem to raise a startup. Um, I like that um, because Make IT promotes digital innovation uh, for sustainable and inclusive uh, development. And um, starting in Nigeria and Kenya, uh, this initiative, um, I think, uh, pr contributed to this ecosystem. And uh, if you want, I can um, elaborate on the wholesale funds, uh, but um, I'll make a break. Um, Ian, maybe you, uh, you want to uh, ask another question. Okay, but maybe um, it's a moment to bring in Suhaila, Suhaila Ofata. I mean, you invest substantially in the US, also the EU, I think the Middle East, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you do know quite a bit about finance, but finance is probably not the only thing startups will require to accelerate, to uh, sort of scale up their business. And you have a vision, so might you want to enlighten us? Well, enlightening is a, is a big word, but let me, let me start with an introduction, okay? So your audio is good, you guys hear me well? Perfect. So, um, I'm the managing director of BMW iVentures. This is a 500 million euro venture capital fund, which is um, run by the BMW Group and invests on behalf of the BMW Group in the future of mobility. So sustainable investment themes, we're more of a deep tech investor and our geographic focus is the US and Europe, not the Middle East. But there is a connection because I'm uh, of North Africa. That's that's where my family is from. That's where I have my roots. And um, while I've spent the last 10 plus years uh, working with my headquarters in the Silicon Valley and in Tel Aviv, and I had the opportunity to see how a developed ecosystem looks like, what makes it successful. I always say I, I still have my roots and my connection uh, on the continent. So I started to, you know, wonder what I could potentially do to contribute to that upcoming ecosystem, to the positive development that is seen. And uh, started a new initiative, which is called the African Tech Vision. The idea of this initiative is to build a platform for the ecosystem building, because I've seen a lot of great initiatives across the, the, the continent, a lot of really amazing people that have accomplished a lot. Um, what I'd like to contribute and bring to the table is you know, a platform that helps these initiatives to scale up, um, and connects uh, at the end what I call the demand, which are young female founders in our in our um, sort of uh, endeavor. We focus on female founders with the supply they need, and the supply could be knowledge, know-how, could be connections to corporates. Within my role, I know exactly how it, important it is for a startup to achieve first traction with uh, a potential, you know, corporate client uh, if it's a B2B play, and on back of that, 
go out and fundraise. There's no point in fundraising if you don't if you don't haven't created value yet. So um, that is sort of what I'm doing with the team. We have a lot of uh, international partners that want to support us, but I have a very very firm interest, and also here for everyone who's listening to partner with local organizations. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but we would like to take what is already there and make a contribution in a sense that keeps this authentic African. Um, and that is the African tech vision. I don't know if you now feel all enlightened, but this is what it is about. But I've learned a lot more, thank you. No, it's a brilliant well, initiative, I like the approach. Um, I wonder, for the three others, and maybe one of you want, would like to go first. Besides access to finance, what's important for startups to accelerate? Mm. Uh, maybe I can take that one uh, because I, I was indeed very enlightened by uh, what you say, Sohalia. And uh, I have to say it, it's very true that um, for entrepreneurs that don't only need access to finance, it actually uh, before even attending to this, there is a, a journey uh, to accomplish before. And this is why at Melanin Capital, for instance, we really focused on investor readiness, which is also a little bit of the big words I know uh, that has been said, but this really summarizes it all. Um, the big issue that uh, my co-founder and I realized by just being ourselves in our home countries, for him in Kenya and for me in Congo, we just that we had so many good entrepreneurs with amazing ideas, but at the same time, the issues uh, is that sometimes they just uh, simply don't convey their message the right way, or they focus on topics or criteria or KPIs that the investors are not really interested about. So, for instance, at Melon Capital, we also have a similar approach as yours. We are trying to focus on building capacity for them and finding for them the right partner so that they can get their first revenues and their first traction um, through a program that is called Ungane, where we connect uh, entrepreneurs. We help, for example, startups to get a partner that can build the technology for them or a partner that can provide more talents or, or a specific clientele that they will need to be more attractive uh, for investors. And then the next step is to put the right people in the room, right? Because if there's a lot of entrepreneurs that they all talk to this big name uh, that I won't, I won't mention uh, anyone, but it's, uh, it's about big institutions or big investors funds that they've seen on newspapers, on, on, on blogs. But it is more about creating the right investor for you. Is it an investor that understands your sector? that understands your product, because if you have a cryptocurrency product, for instance, not everyone is actually habilitated to understand what you're trying to deliver. And is it an investor that has the mandate to invest in what you're looking for? And all of this, there is kind of an asymmetry of information regarding to that. And this is why I think that your project and all the, the, the information that are now available more and more by this people Africa or make IT from GIZ is crucial for the for the entrepreneur to understand how they can navigate this market and be investor ready. So I think, you know, Melanie, I could just echo what you said. Uh, every, there is no, you know, first time or second or third time entrepreneur and the entire planet who has it all figured out. So that's the same for every mm -hmm. ecosystem. The only difference is if you look at the ecosystems like the Silicon Valley or like Tel Aviv, you will find uh, you know, people that might have a bit more experience because they started early on. You will have an uh, easier way to access to resources. So coming back to your question, sort of, Ian, and what's missing, uh, Melanie has touched up on this. Access to business networks is critical and access to high quality business networks. So once I spoke with a couple of people across the continent that run accelerators and so on, um, the common dominant uh, dominator was that they're saying, well, there are a lot of you know programs, and there are a lot of people that want to mentor, but these mentors are partially of poor quality, which is then hindering really good entrepreneurs to tap into certain programs, which I find really interesting. And I think it's a natural thing if, if an ecosystem is young. So if there is a way to bring in really top-notch people from the continent and also globally, both has to work. It can't be just one or the other. I think this is very helpful for all entrepreneurs. 
specifically with the African Tech Vision, I'm representing female tech entrepreneurs. And for them, it's even harder to tap into the business networks because most of the networks are tailored to men and men needs. So this is, this is what we would like to achieve. So when we speak about our purpose, we're saying we want to build and nurture the next generation of purpose-driven African uh, female founders and their ecosystem. And this is what it's about because there's so much potential on the continent. And to our believers, women are the backbone of the content. They are building up the content, co contributing to society and community, but they are not participating equally in the upsides, in the economical upsides. And this is what we want to change. Thank you. Tommy, you surely have a vision on that. Yes, I do. And it's great to hear what Sahali uh, has been saying. I've got some awesome news for you. First of all, you might want to write this down. Rising Tide Africa is an all women's angel group out of Lagos, Nigeria. Dazzle is an all women's angel group out of Cape Town, South Africa. We're working on others in Morocco, in Egypt, and surprise, surprise, even in Ethiopia. So women are staking their, their claim um, in this terrain. And the reason I keep bringing up angel investors is because angels provide personal capital. What do we mean by that? It's not just about cash. In fact, in my case, I don't even start with cash. If you haven't been in my mentoring program, you're not going to get into my advisory program. If you haven't been into my advisory program, that means I didn't determine that you're investment worthy. It's after you've gone through those two stages, then you get my syndicate and we do tickets up to quarter of a million dollars. It's after that, that we talk about the network. And I am not alone anymore. It's interesting, I can name, let me just reel off some names for you. In Cairo, Egypt, you've got people like Khaled Ishmael and Ali El Shalkani. In Nairobi, Kenya, you have people like Stephen Gugu. In Cape Town, I just talked about Dazzle Angels, Alexander Frazier, okay? Let's go to Lagos, Yemi Kerry, Rising Tide Africa. Um, or should we go to Morocco? We've got Kenza Lali, um, Dakar, uh, Ma Ma uh, Mariam Diop. She's going to thump me for nearly forgetting her name. I could go on and on and on. The good news is this is already starting to happen. Angels provide, first and foremost, some kind of time to guide, to advise, and to mentor. Second, just by their nature, they're high net worth individuals, so they have access to business networks that these startups would have no way of getting access to. I'll give you an example. I, I was at a demo day. The startup, amazing startup they pitched. I loved what they were doing. What was their challenge? They couldn't get into any of the mobile network operators. Two phone calls later, they're hooked up to the mobile network operators. They're doing 300,000 a month there and after. And finally, of course, it is cash. And with cash, we've now, we're now syndicating. So for example, we now have something called the Diaspora Network Angels. And what they do is they bring Africans in diaspora to co-invest with these local angel networks. So that is already starting to happen. Now, even the better news is what Green Tech Capital does, which speaks to the point Melanie was making earlier. What we do at Green Tech Capital is actually called results for equity. So we provide the resources, whether it's a digital marketer, it's a developer, whether it's somebody who's going to create your back end or you need a chief operating officer. And these are people with expertise in industries and in the locale. We provide them to the startups based on specific milestones to be achieved. And when those milestones are achieved, that's when we collect equity, not cash. So it makes for a very, very good marriage with the angel investors. So that's how we're starting to address the challenge we feel we see on the continent. I trust that helps. Thank you. Thanks also for um, reminding me to mar write it down. Actually, I do know those organizations, so I can remember them. And um, I agree that angel investing is super important. This is what you see in every developed ecosystem. But just as echoing what Melanie said, Money is important, but it's not all that it takes. And as I'm mentoring also a ton of entrepreneurs internationally, I know that it's important for an entrepreneur to create value before giving away equity. Angel Correct. investors are super important. 
specifically if they are well connected in the local ecosystems. If they can open doors and if they have those business relationships, I couldn't agree with you more, but I think it takes a lot of layers. This is one super important layer. It's amazing also to hear about the diaspora network. That one I wasn't aware of before. So I think it is just important that if you think about an ecosystem, that you it's like a recipe, right? You know, it needs different parts and money is one, but also helping entrepreneurs to tap into the resources, the know-how, finding a way to create innovation uh, relationships with corporates. So while here, the BMW Group, the Bosch, and thousands of others, large organizations have vast startup programs. I'm missing to see that a lot of large corporates in Africa have these types of programs. There might be a lot of reasons why I'd be happy to hear from you what your th thinking is of why this is missing, but this is definitely a part of the ecosystem building if you compare it to other ecosystems that creates value for the founders. And it should be not as hard to tap into these resources. I always ask myself one question, why can a little boy or little girl aged 12 in Silicon Valley or in Tel Aviv sit back and dream their entrepreneur dream. It's it's natural to them because they are in a large ecosystem. Everything is accessible and that same self-confidence should have every African young girl or young boy and just thinking of the problems they might see around them, come up with creative solutions and just seeing themselves as an entrepreneur. And this takes multiple layers. As I said, it's a recipe. It's not just one ingredient. I, exactly. Uh, Andreas. Uh, Andreas uh, Beckerman. I'd like to come in on, on uh, the, uh, the point Tommy raised earlier on the local uh, policies and some of them even getting uh, worse. So um, you're describing now the ecosystem and, uh, and the ministry cannot, can we'll do some refinancing in whole, wholesale, um, but we can also have uh, partnerships with uh, the countries um, talking about the in investment uh, conditions. It's like um, showing the partners a, a mirror, how it actually, um, how their policies uh, work when, when it comes to individual uh, investments. And for this, we had this um, approach with the G20 and um, we had these two conferences and we had commissioned the IFC, the International um, finance corporation to to do studies and all those studies are available online on the uh, conditions uh, private uh, face in in the countries and um, and there's some sort of um, uh, com uh, competition and I think it's uh, good that um, we can work on those policies because at some point um, even angel investors with uh, good uh, networks. Uh, come to um, come to their limits when, for example, uh, those tax uh, those unforeseen tax rises um, dis disturb the system. So I think there there's also a role, and we have some uh, partnerships, and they have to be long term, otherwise they don't work um, with African countries on uh, private sector um, uh, investment conditions. Back to you. Thank you. Andreas Beckermann. This may be a good moment because we learned that there's a lot to be written down, especially for the participants in this conference. A lot of new insights, a lot of new leads. What you could also write down, though, are the questions that you might have to your panelists, because I'm going to do another round with my dear panelists, and then I'd like to bring in questions of the audience as well. So uh, shoot, shoot over those questions. Um, use the chat function and the colleagues at AfroLink will then collect them and we'll, we'll bring them to the, to the panel. Um, but dear panel, maybe we haven't spoken about one elephant in the room, which is of course the COVID-19 pandemic, which might have changed the whole funding and support landscape on the African continent, but also on all other continents. Businesses are affected, supply chains are interrupted, liquidity might be more scarce than it used to be. So how does the pandemic play in and are there good initiatives, good ideas to mitigate that? I see one hand, Andreas Beckermann. Yes, um, 
So when the uh, pandemic uh, hit um, and we were going into a lockdown, uh, um, we were reprogramming uh, funds. And I learned uh, one lesson that um, in a crisis, you can only use the instruments you have developed in good times and then uh, try to uh, augment uh, the amounts available to them. There's no, no use at all to start something new when everybody's in crisis modes and communication takes longer. So for us, it's very important to have um, the, uh, the local, um, meaning uh, in different African countries or in different African sub-regions, uh, those uh, uh, venture capital uh, companies, those uh, investors, and then we can ask them um, what, what they need. But we could not build new structures. And luckily uh, for Germany, it's true for some other European countries, not for all, um, our parliament gave us more money so we can do more to fight the pandemic where as um, in other uh, other private investors uh, became more reluctant so those structures which which we had uh, we could um, refund uh, them so increase the amounts uh, but we couldn't build new ones what's what are your other experiences let me just chime in right here um so post covid it, we've seen in the press a lot of conversation around resilience and that we need resilient supply chains resilient infrastructure what i typically um say if people talk about this is that they should you know put you know put their focus and shift towards the continent because they're actually the most resilient entrepreneurs and probably business angels as well that you've ever met and that's super interesting because this is now becoming a skill set sort of a, a mindset that is being published everywhere everyone talks about it and wants to understand it and i think there are new opportunities coming alongside with the shift um, in the mobility space i'm representing um, the mobility space i can definitely say that there are new business models on the horizons there are existing business models that have to adapt but there might be also new opportunities one quick note here um, is i had an interesting conversation uh, with the representatives from the mit and uh, Interestingly, when you look at the US now, you see all those Ivy League schools and you see that the registration numbers are dropping because people are saying, okay, I'm probably not going to spend that much money for just all virtual class. And, and these organizations are right now looking for valuable content and valuable experiences to their you know, MBA students and so on. And I pitched to them, said, clearly you should do more in Africa because these will be the smartest, most resilient entrepreneurs you've ever met. So um, it's just a small side note, but I do think given the challenges that there are at the moment and given the fact that, you know, it's not comparable to um, the situation in Germany where there are tons of governmental grants which are now pushed into the ecosystems. It's insane. It's 200 billion new uh, um, years of debt only this uh, next year and uh, over 100 this year. So when, you know, entrepreneurs keep on whining here in, in Germany, I always tell them you have nothing to complain about. You're still doing really, really good. And um, I have confidence uh, in, in the continent and that there will be a lot of uh, smart uh, entrepreneurs that come up with new um, solutions given the current situation. Thank you for that confident outlook. Mm. Melanie, you will also have well, experienced yourself how the pandemic has changed life both for investors and investees. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted to, to echo to what so, so Haila has just said, because we've seen with COVID amazing business models emerging. Uh, that was the, the opportunities that came with that catastrophe. And uh, for instance, we supported a startup that helped a pregnant women uh, during COVID getting access to, to health care after a few hours called Wheels for Life in, in Kenya. And what we found absolutely amazing is the whole collaboration that came around that startup. And you see, exactly, you see different, uh, different approach to, to support those kind of, of business models. The Kenya Healthcare Federation got involved. So then you have public sector support for the startup. And when a startup has the whole government behind uh, to also scale up, so this is where we are talking about a different scale. Uh, we had Bolt and Uber that decided also to support to help pregnant women to get access to those to those services. So then you also have corporate, as uh, Sohaila was saying, 
which is much needed. This support is really needed for the startups that are coming on board. And then for an investor, for a business angel, it is much more com like comfortable for them to come and invest. And we saw on the investor space really different ways of, uh, let's say, investing during this pandemic. Because, of course, we couldn't go on site. We couldn't go do market visits, uh, see all the startups in the incubators, shake their hands, verify their technology, verify their files. Uh, we couldn't do our due diligence. So we had to rely on an ecosystem locally with experts that can that could um, give us a little bit more guidance about how it is going on in the country with experts that understand the public sector locally. And that's what, that is really key and really important. And then it became much more easier for European investors to just do the investment through Zoom and through video conference. And we see how we can save us a lot of costs by not traveling left, right and center and relying on people who know on the ground and kind of collaborate together to assess the startup, to assess properly the risk without really adding all those extra layers uh, of risk as we've seen before and work with the local public sectors, the local business angels, and um, and also, of course, uh, with, our, with the, the European staff. It works really well. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Tommy. Yep. Yeah. Um, what can I say? They've, uh, you know, Sahalia and uh, Melanie have said it all. Um, but here's the thing: change is the new normal. Okay. That 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 you can take for granted. Okay. It's COVID today. It's going to be something else tomorrow. What we've discovered is, what we why we've been trying to change, get people to change. Okay. Um, and that hasn't really happened. Look at what COVID has done to the world. We've moved from islands of excellence to systems thinking. All of a sudden, people are realizing, okay, that collaboration is the way forward. And it is those who seek advantage in adversity, not just doing risk mitigation, but actually create advantage, okay, by rapid adjustment and adaptability. Those are the guys that are winning, okay? Experimentation has become a standard operating procedure. Who would have thought Thank that? Thank you. You know, who yeah. would have thought that? And now it is those whose corporate cultures, who have developed cultures that have learning as the center of their ethos, those are the guys that are winning. And those are the kind of things we're discovering because we're looking and we're saying, wow, wow, wow. And when you sort of unlayer the onions, you start to see that it's that collaborative systems approach that is winning time and time and time again. So that's the little bit of nugget I just wanted to uh, add to this particular conversation. And I trust that helps. Thanks for that nugget. Yeah, I think we, that we works, actually have that works in a, uh, in a liberal uh, country. And I think um, the experience you're making in this fast changing um, environment of, of financing uh, startup and companies, there needs to be a, a feedback loop to the regulators. Some countries really want to um, um, su support uh, this, this um, ecosystem but the regulators uh, need information of this uh, fast changing. And when we look from Berlin, uh, trying to, uh, to refinance funds on the African continent, um, there needs to be a lot of aggregation. So um, the information, we, we cannot process information on 55 uh, country, individual countries, but we uh, have to learn the main uh, uh, trends and um, what is how financing is changing. So when it's fast changing, you're lucky in a liberal country, but otherwise you, you have to take the, the regulator on board with you. Yeah, taking the regulator on board typically is something which doesn't help for speed, but I agree it's important. Um, but sometimes you just got to do lots of things in parallel. So for all of the entrepreneurs that are listening right now, I think this is a very unique opportunity where you have business opportunities, partnership opportunities, not just with, you know, obviously, um, potential clients, but also with a lot of international, very successful startups. So what my prediction is, 
we have seen a shift in the entire financial ecosystem towards catering to ESG, economical social governance uh, criteria. And this is also um, sort of a measurement framework which is now hitting the venture asset class very uh, massively, which is why a lot of venture funds are now looking into that direction. So while at the beginning of the year, you, you had a lot of traction on environmental causes and in Davos, everyone was speaking just about environmental causes, how to reduce CO2, which is all extremely important. My prediction is that um, after the pandemic, there will be more a focus on the S, the social part, because there are a lot of entrepreneurs that now use their technologies and their capacities to contribute in a positive way to society. I don't think that all of these entrepreneurs will just go back to business as usual, but will still you know, ask for their purpose and how they can contribute. So this is the perfect time to reach out to partners which you know, in the in in the past, haven't been possible to reach. That wouldn't be willing to partner with you. And as Melanie has already said, now everything is digital. So there is no the, the disadvantage of being disconnected from a very active ecosystem is a lot uh, less uh, relevant now that everything is digital and everyone can be connected at all times. So I'd like to encourage all entrepreneurs out there to see and look for the opportunities that are arising given this um, current situation. Thanks for that advice and the encouragement also to entrepreneurs and startups listening in to us. We have one question of Daphne, it blends well with the question I already had prepared, which is if you can give any concrete advice to startups um, and, and that's Daphne's strong wish and I share that, it's a good one, um, especially for those startups that are not based in the usual hotspots, so um, regions where there already is a lot of action and traction, looking at Kenya maybe, or Nigeria or South Africa. So especially if you're not in these, what advice can the startups, the entrepreneurs uh, get from you? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can take this one first, but uh, I, would, I would first echo on, on what Sohaile has said at the beginning of this conversation, because I think this is very important to remember. Um, you have to focus first on creating value and getting that traction before going for the money and going for the investment. That would be the, the, first, uh, the, the first advice. Try to uh, reach out for partnerships. Uh, try to use all the free resources that are available today by the GIZ, by the uh, VC for Africa, ABAN, uh, the Africa Tech uh, platform that we had the vision today, AfroLink. This is, we have a myriad of, of free resources uh, that explains how you can become investor ready. You have different uh, uh, free courses that you can uh, get to, to, to refine your product. So that, that would be the first thing. Second, once you have actual traction and actual revenues that you manage to generate, uh, be very selective with the mentors and the investors that you're looking for. Because it is not because the person has the money uh, and um, I've seen this a lot of time uh, in, in Fr Francophone Africa, where indeed we are not the, the hotspot yet in some countries. Uh, it's not because the person has the money that it, it needs to be your. It, does he understand your product? Have you done your the due diligence also on his investor? Where is the money coming from? Is he, um, is he very transparent with you regarding uh, the investments that he's providing to you? Uh, what looks like a very huge opportunity today might be a disability tomorrow. And in investors, it's like a marriage. So you need to make sure that uh, you have selected the right person that can help you grow and that can open the right door uh, and, uh, and not be a disability later on when you will raise funding from other institutional investors. So that's, that would be the two big advice I would like to the entrepreneurs that first uh, look, at, look at us today. Great. Other nuggets of advice? Uh, advice, maybe... advice to startups? Well, the first, uh, probably to me, the single most important thing is make sure you're solving a problem that people actually value. 
okay? The more people that value the problem you're solving, okay, the easier it is to find accomplices along the way, whether they're the funders, whether they're your value chain partners, whoever else it is, if that problem really, really is something a lot of people have and respect, then you're halfway there already. That's sort of the first nut to crack. The second is what Melanie was saying, be very selective in who you take on the journey, okay? Investors, employees, partners, they're all coming on the journey with you. You've got to know that they can go the distance. See every relationship like you would a marriage, okay? You don't propose to every person you meet. It's the same way, okay, when you're building a startup. That applies, I don't care, yeah, they've got millions and millions of dollars and you're broke. It's not the point. The point is, are they good enough for you for the length of the journey? Those would be the things I would say to any entrepreneur that's listening, okay? Be sure you're creating value. Choose your partners wisely. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to add one more very pragmatic um, advice is make sure you have a good lawyer. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the counter. Yes. Yeah, that, that happens to entrepreneurs all the time. There's nothing worse <laughs> than for an investor who finds a cool company and then, you know, looks into their legal work and it's all messed up or you have a messy cap table or whatsoever. Make sure that you understand what your lawyer is telling you. So you know exactly what the terms of the deal are, because in difference to a marriage, so I always also compare VC to to being married and uh, M and A, by the way, to to getting a divorce. Um, <laughs> But with a marriage, there might come a contract. In many countries, there are no contracts, but the contract does not have so many terms that will ruin you later on, take all of your equity and potentially not make you uninvestable. So take that legal part super serious. There are a lot of resources that can be used in order to get a sort of better understanding. Um, even if, if there are no standards within your ecosystem, go and look for other standards from other associations. Um, there are venture capital associations worldwide if you have a good uh, angel investor like Tommy, he's the person who can connect you and, and tell you exactly uh, what you should be, you know, um, to pay attention to, because this can really damage everything. I mean, you could you could be super smart. You have the brightest idea. You have you solving a problem that people need. You build up value and then want to bring in investors only later. But if your legal work is not good, you will not succeed. Good point. That's good advice. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sohali. Unfortunately, I have to go. It seems our time is nearly done. Can Let's wrap maybe, it up. Thank can you. Can we maybe wrap it up with one indication of, and in a sentence or two, a new trend or a new tendency that startups have to be aware of um, so they can take one more note in this discussion? I do it quick. Health tech, obviously, and education. So ed tech, health tech, and ed tech are super hot places to be in for very obvious reasons. People are now going paranoid on health. There's a lot of money put into health, and everyone, when it comes to education, wants online services. So these are two great areas to uh, launch and uh, grow a company in. I will actually. Green, uh, green finance, so investors um, uh, look into uh, green investment opportunities. You have mentioned the ESG uh, criteria, uh, so um, green finance is one of those uh, trends. Thanks. Go ahead. Coming. Um... Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking because we already had so many ideas and in, in general, I, I agree with what has been said, but uh, um, I would say in general, if, uh, if you're not able to do uh, your business remotely at the moment, uh, it's going to be very difficult. So just think COVID and resilience first, and that's definitely something that will support you uh, in, your, in your growth and your fundraising. Okay, um, I'm saying we talk about KPIs. These are key performance indicators. Guess what? 
we're now starting to look at flexibility, sustainability, and adaptability actually as KPIs. How's that? That's brilliant. So Melanie, Sohela, Andreas, and Toby, many thanks for all these nuggets of advice, knowledge, and experience. I had a tremendous time with you. I thank you very much. And I believe that the audience also enjoyed your contributions. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.